Hello and welcome back to the lab. This is a continuation video on a question and answer session. Well, lots of questions were asked. I did an answer video about the soldering setup and uh, that was very popular uh, from the metrics on YouTube. Lots of people like that video. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about the other half of the equation. I'm also gonna answer some questions that were posed in that soldering video and we're going to go from there. So this video is going to be about solder and what to use in the lab and some stuff you definitely shouldn't use in the lab. Um, great deal of difference and there is there's a lot of stuff you can use but there is definitely some stuff that you should not use. So that is what this video is today. So I'm going to go get a, a drawer out of my vintage chest of drawers. We'll bring it back. We'll throw it on camera. And we will reveal, reveal some more lab secrets. Solder, leaded and lead-free. So I have, an or, I have a uh, drawer that I keep all of this stuff in to help kind of organize it in the lab. Let me move the camera. So this is more a chest of drawers that I got and uh, lots of metal drawers, the old tin. Uh, it was in great shape, and I'm using some internal dividers to help sub-organize the um, solution. So we have a lot of types of solder in here, from the very new to the very old. The way I have this organized is we have leaded solder in the back, lead-free solder up front, and unknown solder up front. Now some of this stuff, so some of the rolls that are in this box are like this, burns plumbing solder. This is not to be used for electronics. First off, it's way too thick. Like this stuff is huge. Um, this is the roll of solder that I'm currently working on, working with in the lab. I don't know how well this is gonna show up on camera but you can see the wire diameter difference. Obviously trying to do surface mount stuff with this stuff, even if it would work, um, isn't gonna happen just by the wire diameter. Now the other problem is plumbing solder typically does not have flux in it. So this is usually just solid solder wire flux free. Um, I do have some plumbing solder because I do use it in plumbing but this is not to be used on boards and electronics. Let's see what else we have in here. There's an old roll. Heath kit solder. We have a 6040 alloy, which we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, I would not use the 6040 alloy. Um, there's also not much left on that roll if any at all. What else do we have? We have some rosin core. This is pretty thick stuff too. Um, so this has flux core in it and this would be okay for electronics. Definitely on the thick side compared to the, what is this stuff? 0 0.025 inch diameter. Um, so again, 6040, this is the old stuff, uh, still works, um, but there is better these days. Uh, more 6040, oh, multi-core. So that is one of the good brands of, um, solder, everybody will end up developing their preferred brand or what they use in their own personal lab. Uh, the lab here is not sponsored, so nobody knows me for anybody, and so this is just stuff that gets used in the lab. Um, I did not pay for these older wheels. These came in with a uh, some estate items that I had, more 6040, but... Um, None of the companies that are featured in here are sponsored. They don't know who I am. Uh, Multicore, again. 
uh, another 60-40 variant. Um, I'm going to use up the rest of this 60-40 because it does work. However, um, I am not a uh, I'm not a fan of the 60-40, and I'll get into that. Um, this is one of the wheels that I use regularly on the bench. MG MG Chemicals uh, Kessler also makes great solder, multi-core. Uh, this Loctite stuff is actually pretty good too. This is my um, this Loctite wheel is my thin stuff. So for doing surface mount and stuff like that, I find a thinner wire is better. Let's see, does this tell me what the wire diameter is? Probably not. Uh, Multi-core. I've had this for a while. This was bought in 17. So for this being a six-year-old roll of solder, you can see how often or how fast it goes away. It does not go away very fast, even though soldering is a uh, wasteful process, and I do use a lot of it, especially with removing components, putting components on boards. Um, but a, a pound wheel of solder will last a very, very long time. Um, oh, 0 0.038 millimeters right there. If the camera's going to focus, probably not. There we go. So this is the thinnest solder wire that I have. This Kessler roll, which is one pound. Um, this is 6337, which is the uh, preferred alloy that I use. The reason for that is it freezes better. So when you solder something, you melt the solder wire into the or onto the components, and it flows out. And we will get into that um, if there's even more interest. I will do a video actually soldering and go into some of the tricks and techniques of doing different types of components. Um, this is also 0.8 millimeters, so a little thicker. Uh, 031 inches. So, this is a little thicker than the MG. I'm holding this stuff off camera. Let me zoom out just a little bit. Doing this around the camera is kind of hard. So, the uh, Kessler roll that I have is a little bit thicker than the MG. So, a different um, wire diameter is always... Uh, a couple different wire diameters is good to have. So, I have 025... 031, and then the really thin stuff, actually it'd be the other way around, it would be 031, 025, and the really thin stuff at 0.38 millimeters. Even at 0.38 millimeters, this is still rosin core solder, so it's still cored. Uh, this is a tri-core, it looks like, tri-core brand. Still leaded, 6040, so we'll use all this stuff up, but so it goes back there. This is the uh, the green spool. Kessler does this. Um, the white spools are leaded. The green spools are lead free. So the green spool is actually tin, 96%. Silver, 3%. Copper, 0.5%. The copper makes the tin behave in the lead free solder. Tin really doesn't like behaving in and of itself. Um, in some of the lead lead free alloys so they put a little copper in there to make it behave a little better i use this stuff on the ceramic strips so if i have to do any vintage tech stuff things like that and i don't have the tech solder that they have some some of the units do or i want to keep that roll um unused and left in the unit i use this on the um ceramic strip i have yet to have a problem with this kill a ceramic strip but this was one of the few alloys I could find that had a 3% uh, th sorry 3% silver alloy. Uh, this roll was not cheap. With a 3% silver, I think this roll of solder was like 90 bucks. But it's, um, it's going to last forever because I don't use this on, the, on, on regular. I save this for um, ceramic strip. This was my first, the first solder I grabbed for ceramic strip. 
Uh, what's the alloy? Does it tell me? Uh, this was MG Chemicals version. I don't know if I ever found out what the alloy was. I haven't used much. As you can see, I've used a little bit, but not a ton. So, and then I believe, yeah, this solder I was able to find, but I was not able to find. Uh, it's an Alenco uh, solder wire, and it does 96% tin, 4% silver, but I was not able to find this in a one-pound roll. I could only find it in these tubes. If I can find this in a one-pound roll, I'll get I'll grab one because um, for the ceramic strip, I'd like to find uh, five percent silver or better, but I haven't been able to find that yet. So, one of the most important things for the solder for the act of soldering, in and of itself, is cleanliness of the joint. We get a lot of cleanliness out of, uh, that's not a flux pen, out of uh, flux. And that's a deoxid pen, okay. So I don't have any flux pens. I thought I used it. So typically the paste solder, uh, soldering paste, I don't use a lot of these unless I'm plumbing. Um, although this does say it's okay for electronics. This, I do not use much in the lab, and there's a reason for that. Because... I do not know for sure if this is acid flux or not. However, it doesn't specifically say it's acid flux, but it does say residual flux must be removed and neutralized which means it will keep eating at the joint if it's left on the board. So this, this has to be really careful. So this might be acid flux, and that is something you definitely want to stay away from in the electronics world is do not use acid flux on anything. All the Heath kit stuff even says it. It's like the third line in every manual. Do not use acid flux in this assembly. I don't know of anywhere. I, I have not run into any situation where I have wanted to use acid flux for any reason. Um, in anything. So, um, I just kind I personally stay away from the acid flux. What I do use, what I do use a bit of is MG Chemicals Rosin Flux. So, do not buy a bottle larger than one liter. I bought this bottle, uh, I don't even know if there's a date code on this bottle, but I bought this bottle years ago, and I have barely touched it. So, uh, the it's 835 is the chemical number. And a bottle like this will last a long, long time. <laughs> so, in the leaded solder, there's two very common alloys. One is 6040, the other one is 63. 37. If you're going to buy a roll of solder, my recommendation, and this actually is a recommendation, is buy the 6337 from whoever you'd like to get it from. The main difference between the two is how the solder freezes on the joint. The 6040 solder, as it cools, it goes through this plastic region where the joint's not fully frozen and can move but it's not liquid either, so if it does move, it gets disturbed, and um, it, you can end up with a bad joint, uh, or, or one that fails in short order. The 6337 alloy actually solves that problem. As it's cooling, and it's coming down the heat curve, it goes through a transition region where it goes from liquid to solid, and it's like a degree, and it's frozen. The 6040, if I remember correctly, it has about a 20 degree swing where as it's cooling, now it, it goes through it pretty fast because it's cooling from, I solder most of my joints at uh, 640 degrees, uh, 650 degrees Fahrenheit. I apologize to the rest of the world that's on the other system of temperature measurement. I'll do the conversion here in a little bit. Uh, but as you're cooling down from 650, to room temperature, 
it's a big temperature gradient, so it cools very quickly. Uh, so you go through that 20 degree region pretty fast, but it can still, the joint can be disturbed, things like that, stuff can move, and it can be an inferior joint. So the 6337, where it's better, in quotes, is it freezes that tra that freeze transition is is much quicker. It's like a one degree freeze transition, and it's solid. It's done. So if you're going to restock and you haven't tried it, um, grab a small roll of the sixty three thirty seven. See if you like it. I ended up I like it. I can use either comfortably, um, but I found I can work faster with the sixty three thirty seven. As I wait for the soldering iron to heat heat up, the Temperature conversion from Fahrenheit to Celsius at 600 degrees F is 343.33 degrees C. If we get a roll of solder, good old-fashioned leaded, of course, is leaded solder safe? I haven't had any problems with it. Um, I haven't had lead, um, a lead test done in a while. I do know some people who do stained glass that work with leaded solder 24-7 and um, recently got some testing done and they didn't have a problem. Now, the way to make it safe is not to handle it and eat it. So you don't want, you don't want leaded solder in your mouth, around your hands, around food in the lab. That's one of the big, big problems with, um, with lead contamination is after you ingest it, that's where the hazard is. So a lot of people will watch the action of soldering, see if the camera can pick this up, but will way overdo. And, and that wisp of smoke that comes off, I've had people in the past tell me, oh, that's the lead boiling off. You're going to... Um, you're going to have problems. You're, you're breathing lead. Well, I have a fume extractor. As you can see, it's doing a wonderful job pulling the uh, solder smoke away from me. But this isn't the lead. Or the tin, for that matter. So, in a quick reference, lead's boiling point, where it would actually boil and off-gas, where it could be um, breathed in as a, as a vapor, is 3,180 degrees Fahrenheit. That is 1,748 degrees C. The tin aspect of the solder, its boiling point is 4,716 degrees F or 2,602 degrees Celsius. Now, what you are seeing get vaporized and aerosolized is the flux in the solder wire. Move this out of the way. I may drip some on the mat, but that's okay. Even this far away, you can see it getting pulled in. And I think I have my... Uh, yeah, this is on medium, so the fan gets higher. Um, this is yet another... The fume extractor is yet another Hako. Hako, Hako. Not sure how you say it. Product... Uh, the FA430, um, of all the fume extraction that I've used, this is, this is the first professional fume extractor that I've used. It is a night and day difference to the fan with the charcoal filter on the front of it. Um, I can work with the board here, and I have enough draft. And, I mean, there's my roll of solder, another roll of solder for reference. Is how far away we are, and I'm still, it's still pulling the solder smoke into the filter. So, wonderful to work under. Um, so the flux is what's burning off. This is another reason why you don't want to use acid flux when you're soldering in electronics. Not only will it eat the joint or things like that, but it's also vaporizing off the acid. So 
any times that's smoking off, you definitely don't want to be breathing that. So just stick a, just don't use acid flux for uh, electronics work. It's again, I have found no reason no no place where it is worth it. The hotter the iron is, the faster the flux will burn off. Once the flux is burnt off the joint, it will not um, the cleaning action of the flux is gone and uh, it won't solder very well because the joint will start to oxidize and the solder won't stick, also known as wetting. In the soldering video, I'll see if I can get some close-up footage because you can tell when the solder goes because it'll like start to melt, start to melt, start to melt, and then it'll just jump on the joint. And that's when it's gotten hot and clean enough for the act of soldering to take place. And if you're not getting that wetting action, the joint is either too cold or not clean, uh, or the flux is burned off, the joint is catastrophically overheated, flux is burned off, and has started to re-oxidize, in which case you won't have a wetting action either. Uh, continuing to push heat into the joint um, could damage the component. I knew a technician that tried to do that once, and uh, he was using plumbing solder to try to work with some LEDs, um, I forget exactly what he was building, but he was working with some LEDs. He had the LED so hot, the LED was actually turning on from the heat of the soldering iron. That is a catastrophic overheat of the component uh, and should not be happening. Miraculously, the LEDs survived the experience, um, but they were chip on board and stuck to, a, um, uh, stuck to a heat sink. I think that's the only way they survived, but quite literally from thermal energy the LED was turning on never seen that happen before probably will never see it happen again but um, I did actually see it happening since we're on temperature lead free will usually need to run at a slightly hotter temperature than leaded uh, the alloys don't melt as well and they can be kind of fussy to work with um, lead free was one of the other reasons why I got the N2 station uh, I did a video on that in a previous video, and it will be drug out again soon and pressed into service for some of the repairs that I have coming up. I have to do some ceramic strip ceramic strip work. So we're going to do uh, uh, silver-based lead-free with under nitrogen soldering. So should be fun. Um, safety precaution after handling solder, which I'm going to do before I eat or drink anything, is I'm going to go wash my hands. As long as you keep your hands away from your face... Um, don't have any cuts, scrapes, or bruises on your hands, things like that. Um, leaded solder is, is relatively safe to work with. Obviously, you are working with lead. Um, if you are worried about lead exposure and lead-free solder, don't use it or get tested. Um, your local healthcare provider can do a lead test. Uh, if, I, if I remember the process correctly, it is a blood draw, and they'll check your lead levels in your blood. The um, the weird thing here in the States, just know if you go get a lead test, your employer will get a copy of the lead test. <laughs> um, most of the time, uh, employers, depending on what you're working on, if you're working in a lead environment, things like that, they may, they're the ones that really request the lead tests. So um, from what I was told by a couple of people who got the testing done is the healthcare providers just assumed it was an occupational test and sent it to your employer. So you may or may not, uh, obviously I am not a doctor. I am not a medical professional. I'm a repair technician. So take anything I say medically with a grain of salt and, uh, for less than informational purposes at best. <laughs> um, but next time they, uh, um, next time I do a physical, I may have them do the lead test on me just to see where it's at. So I would expect it to be almost non-existent. Um, but food and drink in the lab is a general safety issue, um, is a general good safety practice anyway, whether you are, um, working with solder or not. Some of this equipment is crusty and stuff like that. And, uh, you don't want, you know, 30-year-old dust falling out of a piece of equipment onto your sandwich or into your coffee. So, <laughs> so I hope that cleared up some things on the um, 
solder side of the fence. If there's uh, interest in um, continuing on with the uh, soldering information, we can do a video strictly on soldering and soldering components and go from there. I did get a couple of questions um, about the equipment on that last soldering video. So one of the things to note is one of the main differences between the FR4, um, 410 series and the FR300 series is the solder capture tubes don't have a spring like the 300 series. At the back of the solder capture tube is this metal disc. So the solder comes in hot, hits this, and splashes on it and uh, solidifies. So it'll start building up. So what it'll do is in the tube, it'll start building up from here and pushing forward and forward and forward and get bigger and bigger and bigger until it clogs the tube and you have to clean it. I save what comes out of these. This is all solder that's been removed from the desoldering tool. Um, pretty heavy in there. I'd love to see, I'd love to figure out a way, and I've looked at solder pots and things like that, and I'm not sure. I'd love to figure out a way where I could cast this down into a single brick um, to dispose uh, to either to actually recycle it properly. This is right now lead dust, so obviously I don't want to throw this in the landfill. Uh, that would be hazardous at best. So casting this into a brick and then taking it to the recycling center as a brick of solder is kind of what I want to do, but I haven't really found a good way to cast it out yet. So essentially when this gets full, I'll uh, figure out a way to recycle this. Once I figure out a good way, I'll let you guys know too. But um, this filter that's on the back of the cartridge this is mainly for the flux. So when you hit the go button on the desolder tool, when you pull the trigger, obviously it's not on, it's cold. Uh, when, you, when you hit the go button on the trigger, it pulls flux everything and all that crap up into the desolder gun. You want as much of that to stay in this tube as possible and not get into the desolder pump. That's why this, uh, the 410 has a two-stage... Um, has a two-stage filter on the pump. It has this, which is the ceramic, and it has the um, the paper. Uh, my paper, I'm just getting ready to change. These ceramics don't la um, these change often. Uh, this one actually just changed because it's still a little white. But you can see the back side of the ceramic. You can see the back side of the ceramic. All that junk that it's keeping out of the uh, desolder pump. And this just goes together like that. And this gets pushed in like that. Now these are marked front is this way. So you always want to make sure the filter ends up in the back. And they're quick to change. You just pop these out. Pop the next one in. Push the back closed. Wait for this to cool. And then clean it out. Uh, I did find... Um, having two extra ready to go when they start filling up because what will happen is the um, the solder will get loose and it'll fall into the front of the gun and it'll start to back feed onto the board. So changing these out on the regular is not a bad idea to keep the process going. Okay, um, one other thing that a couple of users suggested is I saw a lot of references to the FX100 um, Haco iron. It's an RF-based iron, similar to the, uh, I believe it's similar to the way the Metcal works. One of the things that I don't like about that iron, and, and I'm not saying I'm not going to try it, I very, well, I very much may order one to get it on video and, and give everybody some thoughts on a, um, after using it for a while, but to do that properly, I need to get one, have it on the bench, use it in projects for a while, see how well it works. The, the big hang-up I have on those is I can't set the tip temperature from the station. The tip temperature is set from the tips themselves. With the FM203 stations that I have, I can swap tips around. Um, these ones that have the funny, these are the N2 tips that have the uh, external jacket. I can switch the tips around um, and not change temperature. 
I also find that I don't need to change temperature <coughs> often. And that with the uh, FM203, 650F is kind of the sweet spot, and it's pretty much where I do almost everything. Even, even chassis soldering. I very rarely have to adjust the um, tip temperature. Now, if I am doing chassis soldering or something really chungus, um, I do move up to this T15 XD15 tip. This has a huge thermal mass at the front end. I have to be careful with this one's hot. But you can see the size difference just in the tips. So this is the tip that I use the most in the lab. And then this is the chassis, quote, chassis tip that I have. It's ju it's just has a huge, huge thermal mass in it. Um, and it still works well. And I don't really need to, um, don't need to bump the tip, uh, tip temperature up much past 6... Um, 650. I also do a lot of soldering by feel. So just from having done the art of soldering for long enough, I know how the joint heats up. I know how the, um, how the solder, solder flows. And uh, it, it's, it, it is almost more an art form then it is a process, but it is something that any, anybody can do. So if there is interest, let me know in the comments below. I may get one of those FX100 stations, the RF-based ones. Um, it's going to run. Uh, I checked the tip temperatures. I don't know if I can get one as, at, at 650. I think they start a little bit hotter than that. Not necessarily bad when you're working with lead-free solder. It tends to need to run a little hotter. But um, I am used to working around 650. Um, for those that are catching this video first, before the other previous soldering video, definitely take a look at that one too. And these are the three tips that I use in the lab the most. Small, medium, large. And we have extra large. But uh, they are the T15 tips and they're the chisel tips. As with every video, thanks for watching, and I hope this helps clear some things up. Let me know in the comments below if there's any more you'd like me to talk about soldering or the art of soldering, I guess. And uh, if there's interest, we will do an actual soldering video that is dedicated to soldering components and boards, through hole, surface mount, things like that, and um, going through the process. The lab is starting to ramp up. Thanks in no small part to everybody who's here. And uh, I'm starting to do some full board assemblies, um, not just repairs, but actually board design and full assemblies. I have a couple boards in the works where we're going to do we're we're going to be doing a lot of soldering, especially if people would like to order some of those boards. I don't know I, exactly how I'm going to handle some of that yet, but um, this is a uh, an action or a task that is going to um, be used regularly in the lab going forward. So with that, I will see everybody in the comments section in between videos. Hit the uh, subscribe button, like, bell. Um, check out Patreon if you're interested. Patreons are usually about three weeks ahead. So um, there is no content behind the, behind the paywall at the moment. Um, I don't know if there will or will not be in the future, but at the moment, it's just a, uh, a delay. And um, Patreon runs about uh, three weeks ahead of YouTube. So hop in the comments section and uh, you'll see me in the discussion. Thanks for watching and more is on the way.